Krishna, very uh, dear devotees. Welcome back once again to our ever ongoing series on the glories of our most beloved Sri Vrindavan Dham. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nivisheshya Shunyavari Paschata Deshatarane All glories to Sri Prabhupada. <coughs> So we are continuing with our series on historical Vrindavan, and this will be part six. As I mentioned on my Facebook page, because summer is just around the corner, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere, I will be um, traveling extensively again for a few months, so I will only be posting one class a week from now on, each Friday. No Tuesdays, only Fridays. Actually, I was advised to stop altogether because I'm going to be really busy with the Polish tour. Stop until September, they said, but <clears throat> I, um, I love this service so much, and I hope you do too. So at least you can look forward to those um, Friday lectures. And in this way, we'll always remain in touch with our beloved Shivrindavan Dham. Hare Krishna. So for the last um, few weeks, we have been discussing the history of a number of Vrindavan's temples, um, specifically how they were built by devotee kings and queens from um, various parts of India. But today, I would like to discuss another very interesting facet of uh, Vrindavan's history that I uh, came across in my studies in the Vrindavan Research Institute. You may be surprised, <laughs> but it's about how people dressed and ornamented themselves in Vrindavan from the 16th to the 18th centuries. I hope you'll find it interesting because I actually did. <laughs> There's an old maxim, <clears throat> style is a way of saying who you are without having to speak. And that was certainly true in old Vrindavan, as you will see. In Vrindavan in the olden days, um, Vaishnavas would wear wooden shoes called kado, kado. These um, wooden shoes were made from the wood of a very special uh, berry tree whose um, wood never got spoiled, either by water or insects. Isn't that interesting? And these shoes during those times were made in different shapes like uh, rectangular, oval, or pointed. And merchants used to wear extra long shoes called mojaris, mojaris. And they were actually made of a, like a, a hard fabric that I was reading extended up to their ankles. And on their ankles, these Brajabasi merchants used to wear um, very heavy silver bangles. Actually, in fact, every single man and woman in those days wore these heavy silver bangles on their ankles. Sometimes I see them when I go to my antique shops in India. There's lots of these uh, bangles because no one wears them anymore. <clears throat> and uh, in those days, people without these bangles were considered uncultured. And I read that um, all women um, would wear uh, ankle bells and they would paint the upper soles of their feet with that red lac that we see very often uh, in the paintings on the gopis, lotus feet. This red lac is called in, um, in Bengali uh, ata, uh, A-T-A-A, -A, ata <laughs> in Bengali. Only widows would not paint their feet in this way. You know, this red lac was on the upper soles of the ladies' feet. But only, but, but widows would not wear this, this lac. In those olden days, widows would um, live in a separate part of the family house. In those, in those days, remember, people lived with extended families. So they would live in a, in a special part of the house, and they would wear only uh, dull white saris. They would also cook their own food, and they wouldn't participate in festive gatherings. 
Now this may seem unkind, but actually none of this was imposed upon them. Rather, they considered themselves like renunciates. And they were very focused on going back home, back to God, back to the spiritual world. So they acted in that way. Now women in general in old Vrindavan used to wear um, together five types of clothes on their upper body. In, by, by, together I mean by mixing five types of clothes on their upper body and three kinds of clothes on their lower body every day. In, in detail, they used to wear a long blouse um, covering their upper body and over that they wore um, a big jacket with long sleeves. And over that, a small and thin jacket without sleeves, a sleeveless jacket. And, it's not over, over that, a cotton shawl. Now over the cotton shawl, the wives of um, priests, like head priests in temples, they wore uh, a special cloth called uh, odni, odni. And that cloth was um, either red, pink, or orange in color. And it covered a woman's uh, upper bodily ornaments, plus her ears, her hair, and her face. I just thought this was very interesting, how people in those, it's so much different than today. In the village of Vrindavan, this is how they dress. And, and uh, on their lower bodies, the ladies would wear a petticoat, a long skirt, and a co colorful cloth uh, to cover their uh, waists. And all women used to wear bangles on their wrists, plenty of them, made out of lac. And, um, but these particular um, bangles were decorated with different colorful stones. And in winter, ladies wore a long four-layered cotton shawl called a dulai. And a woman's forehead was always decorated with a red bindi if she was married, and unmarried girls wore a small black bindi. As far as the men were concerned in these olden times in Vrindavan, they would always wear uh, red kopinas, um, a dhoti, and bhagobandis, bhagobandis. In uh, Braj Basa language, bhagal literally means um, armpits or sides, and bandi means um, to, to, to tie a knot. So uh, a bhagobandi is a shirt, actually, that's tied with uh, strings of, of cloth into knots on the sides of the shirt. You kind of have to see one to understand, but there are no buttons in those days. Everything was tied here, here, and here, like that. Now, originally the tradition of wearing bhagobandis, it came from the Rajput kings in Rajasthan. I researched that. Where did it actually start? It started in Rajasthan. With, with the Rajput kings. They were very proud to wear these uh, Mongol bandis. And um, there was a rule, actually, that to enter the king's royal court or the royal palace, um, one had himself to wear a uh, Mongol bandi. Otherwise, he couldn't enter. And I was reading that, therefore, at the entrance of the forts and the palaces, there were like these large storehouses or stalls with these Mongol bandis that people visiting the king or coming to the royal court for whatever purpose, they could rent them. <laughs> you come inside the palace, you do your business or attend the festivities, and then afterwards you come out and you return it there at the entrance to the palace or to the, that particular area. You can rent your Mongol Bundy. Here in Vrindavan, we still see some men wearing Mongol Bundys. Um, personally, I have five. I just, you know, love the old culture of Vrindavan. <laughs> just resonates with me. So I have five. Uh, three short sleeve and two long sleeve Mongol Bandis. But I was reading that there were four different kinds of Mongol Bandis that in those, in those days, which are actually not in fashion, you can't see them anymore. Now in winter, <clears throat> Men used to wear large, long bungle bundies uh, filled with cotton that went all the way down to their knees. 
the ones I wear would go to my waist, but these would go down um, to, to their knees, and they were filled with cotton. It was called a fargool, a fargool. And men also used to wear a long uh, cotton cloth called a uh, saufi. It's an interesting name, saufi, which they would, um, they would actually tie it around their waist to secure their dhoti. Sometimes you see um, Iskon Krihastras, I've seen they also do that. They'll tie this. They don't know, they don't know that's an old tradition, maybe. Saufi. They tie it around their waist to hold a, their dhoti up when they're in kirtan. But in olden times, the men would also use this, this piece of cloth to wear over their shoulders. And of course, as is popular today, um, all the men uh, wore chaders, a chaudar. In fact, I was reading, if a man didn't wear a chaudar, he was considered uncultured. Um, a chaudar or a shawl, um, a long, strong stick, a long mustache, and a turban were the signs of a gentleman in old brudge. A chaudar or a shawl, a long stick, a long mustache, and a turban were the signs of a gentleman in old Vrindavan. And on a morning walk in Rome in 1974, I was fortunate to be there with Prabhupada, we, we went to see the Colosseum. I heard Prabhupada say that in his days, a gentleman carried either a stick, an umbrella, or a cane in India, in Vrindavan. That was just, a gentleman did that, a stick, an umbrella, or a cane. You don't see that anywhere in the West, unless someone's, you know, incapacitated. <laughs> but it was maybe not even necessary. They would wear, they would have a stick, an umbrella, or a cane, a gentleman. And I was also reading that this is really interesting. Uh, one could understand a brahmana's status by how he wore his charter. Brahmanas who studied and followed only one Veda, they were known as Upadhyaya Brahmanas, and they wore only uh, one charter over their uh, left shoulder. Brahmanas who studied and followed two Vedas, they were known as Dvivedi, Dvivedi Brahmanas, and they wore two charters, as you can imagine, one on each shoulder. <laughs> And Brahmins who studied and followed three Vedas were known as Tri Vedi Brahmanas, and they wore three charters. How so? One on each uh, shoulder, and the third one around their neck. <clears throat> now, Brahmanas who followed all four Vedas, because there's four Vedas, were known as Chatur, Chatur Vedi Brahmanas, Chatur Vedi Brahmanas, and they wore four charters. Specifically, one on the left shoulder, two on the right shoulder, and one around the neck. I find this fascinating. Now, in Old Brudge, a long and wide mustache indicated that a man um, belonged to a good family, was uh, respected among society, and had power and influence. Long, well, long mustaches. You see them sometimes here in India, especially at the major hotels. They'll have someone outside to receive people when they come in a car, and they're dressed in old Rajput style, and they have these big mustaches. <clears throat> Actually, there I came across there, there was a saying in those days that uh, a man without a mustache is like an elephant without tusks. <laughs> Now, of course, a turban was also a ve very major part of everyone's dressing for men in those days in old Vrindavan. And I really looked into this part. There's a whole section in the Vrindavan Research Institute about dressing and a couple of big books on turbans. And there were many types and styles of turbans that the Brajbasis wore 100 or 200 or 300 uh, years ago. One that um, tilted to the side was called a Tedi Paga. Tedi Paga, actually. Tedi Paga. Uh, a tall turban was known as Safa. 
a straight and narrow one was called uh, paghia, paghia, and one with rolled material, like sometimes you see they roll the, the turban like that. It was called a jalebi pag, jalebi pag. Actually, there's many more, but we have to move on. <laughs> there were many different types of turbans. And I was reading that it was common for men to decorate their turbans with a, a small branch, um, a, a small uh, branch from a, a rose bush, flower from a rose bush, put in the turban, or a small branch from the amla plant, which means um, Indian gooseberry. They take a little branch and so nice. Who does that in London or New York or Sydney? The men don't decorate their hair with flowers or their turbans. Well, they don't have turbans, but their hats. Brudge culture is so sweet. Now, in essence, the main decoration for um, all Brajbasis in those days, that the main decoration, because they're all Krishna Bhaktas, were their Tulsi neck beads. Tulsi neck beads were a very essential part of their dressing. According to the Hari Bhakti Vilas, four. Um, 307, a Vaishnava may wear neck beads of different kinds of wood. It's it stated, uh, well, I'll quote the verse, an individual must wear malas offered to Krishna. Such malas can be made out of uh, tulsi branches, lotus seeds, um, tulsi leaves, um, or the amalaki fruits, again, the Indian gooseberry. You can have you can have a kanti mala neck beads made of these different elements, but Vaishnavas generally preferred tulsi wood, <clears throat> and there were many different uh, traditional styles of these tulsi neck beads in those days. Um, regular, excuse me, rectangular neck beads were only worn by the Gaudiya Vaishnav Babaji's. Rectangular neck beads were worn by Gaudiya Vaishnava Babaji's. Um, round neck beads were only worn by followers of the Radha Balabha Sampradaya. Long, round, circular beads were only worn by Nimbarka Sadhus. And very tiny, uh, square shaped beads were only worn by Pushtimarg Vaishnavas, meaning the followers of uh, Sri Balabhacharya. Now, Getting into detail here, because it's just nectar, these different spiritual groups, these different traditions, these different sampradayas who lived in, in Braj, they also wore, um, to be identified by their sampradaya, they wore different numbers of strands of these Tulsi beads around their necks. One strand around the neck was called uh, Eklari Mala. Two strands around the neck were called Dulari, Mala. Uh, three strands around the neck were called Trivali Mala, and five strands around the neck were called Panchamala. Gaudiya Vaishnavas, our, our lineage, were either two, three, or five strands around their necks. I think it's traditional now, uh, three, at least in Iskon, three. Hopefully, something. Sometimes I see after initiation. Devotees don't wear neck beads, they wear some pretty necklace or something. But we should wear uh, kantimala. Even if it's very small, we should wear kantimala. Um, followers of Dimbarka Swami, they wore only one strand. Followers of Balabhacharya were either one or two strands. Um, devotees of Banki Bihari, from the Haridas Sampradaya, they wore two strands. And I'm sure that these different sampradayas are still following this practice. Now, one can only imagine how many Tulsi plants were required for these different devotees uh, and different sampradayas to have their kanti mala, which was so dear to them, through the ages. Where's all this Tulsi coming from? Well, as you know, there's Tulsi grows everywhere. She's so kind here in Braj. But because so much of this sacred wood was needed, there um, were, and there still are today, big Tulsi plantations in a village 
near to Vrindavan called Jait. Did you know this? I didn't know. We just go to the market and there's the Tulsi Walla, the man who sells the Tulsi beads and the neck beads. And, but where does it all come from? There's a village near Vrindavan called Jait, or sometimes it's called Javana, Javana. And this is where this mass production of uh, Srimati Tulsi Devi uh, is coming from, and she very kindly gives her uh, wood in that way for her devotees to protect them. We're protected when we wear the Tulsi Mala. I was also reading uh, in the Vrindavan Research Institute that some sadhus used to make their neck beads out of old tree logs uh, from, from the wood, that had, the tree that had fallen over from uh, Nidivan. Nidivan is one of the most sacred vanas or groves or forests in Vrindavan, actually it's in Vrindavan proper. Many of you know what I'm talking about, Nidivan. So when an old tree in Nidivan would fall over, then some sadhus used to make their neck beads from that wood. Now, in those days, I was reading, there was also a very special tree whose wood, um, how could you say, matured at a very early stage from which um, sadhus would make their neck beads. And that wood would turn uh, black very quickly. And as a result, their neck beads were known as shaligram kanti. Kanti, by the way, means uh, literally beads which touch the neck. Kanti. Kanti mala means a string. So kanti means beads which touch the neck. Now these various kantis or neck beads were often carved with the Hare Krishna mantra on them. This is something that's been revived. Uh, I've seen in the recent years uh, here in, in Vrindavan, especially out at Radhakund, the sadhus, they carve you know, Sri Radha's name or Sri Krishna's name in the actual bead. And um, it's interesting that in those days, the sadhus used to install their neck beads around their necks by chanting the following mantra. Shkarim, kharim, klim, aim, vrinda, vanye, svaha. And one famous Brajabasi poet, Chatur Bhujadas, he writes in a book I found, Dvadasya Yasya. It's the name of the book, Dvadasya Yasya. You can imagine how much nectar is in that Vrindavan Research Institute. So this Brajavasi poet, he's famous. You know, he, these poets, they bring out emotions, spiritual emotions from our heart. He has a book called Dwadasha Yasha. So he writes there that these sadhus, um, or rather he's, he's recommending, he's saying that one should first mix his um, new neck beads with the dust of Braj. Usually when something falls on the ground, right, you pick it up and you dust it off. No, not in Braj. <laughs> one speck of Braj Renu, one speck of the dust of Braj is considered more opulent, more valuable than all the opulence of Vaikuntha, the official kingdom of God. So he's recommending when you get your new neck bees, roll them in the dust of Vrindavan. And then dip them in the waters of the Jamuna River and then touch them to the lotus feet of a deity in Braj. And then have them touched by any great Vaishnava. Only after that, one should tie this sacred Tulsi necklace around his neck. Shivandavan Dam Ki, the culture of Braj Ki. We have to keep this culture, this tradition. <laughs> there was a common saying in the old days that Wearing Kanti Mala made of Tulsi is equivalent to wearing a band of love around one's neck. Wearing Kanti Mala made of Tulsi is equivalent to wearing a band of love around one's neck. So if you're you know, kind of shy and you're not, you don't want to show beads, maybe you're in school, your office, forget it. Run to your closet, run to the door, take out your Tulsi Mala, and wear it around your neck with pride because it's equivalent to wearing a band of love around one's neck. 
And a famous poet we've quoted many times, Hari Ram Vyas, he says in Braj language, Mohi Vrindavan Raj Sukaj, Mala Mudra Shan Vandani Tilak Hamora Saj. My Braj Bas is getting better. He writes, I love this, my only business, my only business is with the dust of Braj, my Kanti Mala and my Japa beads, and Tilak is my only decoration. My only business is with the dust of Braj, my Kanti Mala, and my Japa beads, and Tilak. It's my only decoration. <laughs> now, there, um, there was a, a very historical incident that happened, um, let me remember now, in the early 16th century in Vrindavan, related to Tulsi neck beads. There was a very powerful Mayavadi sannyasi. His name was, um, let me remember, um, Chidha Rupa Maharaj. Chidha Rupa Maharaj. He was a Mayavadi. And he was an avowed enemy of Vaishnavas. He was very good friends, interestingly enough, with the Muslim emperor of India at that time. Because remember, there's different alliances going on. And, you know, so I, I explained this in previous lectures. You know, the Muslims and the Hindus, they worked together. <laughs> but sometimes there was friendship made. So this Mayavadi sannyasi, he was close with the Muslim emperor of India at that time, whose name was Nur al-Din Muhammad Salim. Al-Akbal alhamdulillah. Nur al-Din Muhammad Salim who ruled from uh, 1605 to 1627, way back here. But this Muslim emperor, he was better known by his imperial name, Jahangir, Jahangir. Now, Emperor Jahangir was actually the third son of Emperor Akbar. You remember Akbar, we all know him very well from our lecture series very favorable to the Vaishnavas in Vrindavan. So this Jahangir, he was the third son of Emperor Akbar. Um, his mother um, was Akbar's favorite queen. Her name was Maryam Uz Samani. And this Jahangir, he had uh, two elder brothers, twins, uh, Hassan Mishra and Hussein Mishra, <laughs> but they died in infancy. So you, I'm saying all these details so you'll understand how very, very dear he was to his father, Akbar. Now, when Akbar died, uh, Jahangir ascended the throne. And somehow or other, he was very inclined to this Mayavad sannyasi, Chitta Rupa Maharaj. And Chitta Rupa Maharaj, extremely envious of the Vaishnavas, and especially those living in Vrindavan, he somehow convinced this emperor, Jahangir, to pass a decree one day that no one within the boundaries of Braj Mandala Bhumi, the greater area of Vrindavan, could any longer wear Kantimala neck beads or tilak. You see how envious this Mayavadi sannyasi was. He convinced the emperor to pass a decree that from this day forth, no one in Braj can wear Kanti Mala or Tilak of any of the Sampradayas. And the decree said that uh, anyone caught wearing Kanti Mala or Tilak would be arrested, beaten, and thrown in prison. Tough times. Tough times. And to ensure this decree was followed to the letter, Emperor Jahangir even established a small army in Vrindavan to catch offenders. We think we have problems, you know, with the local government, the town councils, and we get arrested you know, for book distribution. Listen to this part of history. There's an army to catch you if you're wearing tilak or kantimala, and they beat you and throw you in prison. We should take advantage. These are golden days. Make hay while the sun shines for spreading Krishna consciousness. 
And I was reading that a number of very staunch sadhus who refused to follow this decree, this order, were in fact arrested, were severely beaten and thrown in jail, and the key was thrown away. So as a result, at this point in history, the Brajabhasi started applying water from the Jamuna River as tilak. <laughs> you just take the water and um kesavaya nama. At least something. Well, not at least. Jamuna Jal is so special. But it was invisible. However, no one wore neck beads. And this went on for many years. Everyone let me say, except one devotee. His name was Gokulanath Das, and he was actually uh, a grandson of Balabacharya. He's described as a very great devotee of um, Srinathji, who is presently worshipped in Nathwar, and he was a very renowned uh, scholar of the times. In his younger years, I was reading, he traveled all over India uh, preaching Krishna consciousness with his disciples, and eventually, <clears throat> when he was around, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> this is the result of sleeping with the AC on at night, because at night here in Vrindavan, it's 110 degrees. So you have to wear, the, you have to put on the AC, and you get a little cold. Hare right, Krishna. <clears throat> so eventually, when he was um, 80 years old, he stopped traveling, and he settled down back here in Vrindavan. Um, and this was um, after the, the decree that Emperor Jahangir had um, declared. Now, he, um, our hero here, was the only one who didn't give up his tilak and kanti. He was the only one, this Gokulnath, this grandson of Balabacharya. He just refused. He said, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to give up my tilak and my kanti mala. In fact, he wore them, he wore them very proudly. Uh, you could say defiantly, wherever he went in Brajmandal. And I, I was reading that as a result, Emperor Jahangir's soldiers confronted him and threatened him many times. But afraid of his power, his spiritual power, and his influence, they hesitated to arrest him. They could see this... This person, when I got to touch him, he's got some shakti. So they hesitated to arrest him. So this went on for some time. So eventually, tired of this situation and feeling compassion for all the Vaishnavas who were suffering because we take pride in our tilak, we take pride in our kanti mala. One time, Prabhupada said, our kanti mala shows it's like a dog, dog collar, where the dogs are the spiritual master in a good sense. So one day this devotee, he, he left Vrindavan, Gokulnath, and he, he, he walked all the way to Kashmir, where this emperor Jahangir was spending some time uh, dealing with some bad health. And arriving one day at the palace in Kashmir, which is far from Braj, where emperor Jahangir was staying, Gokulanath Das was somehow granted a darshan with the emperor where he therein expressed his very deep disapproval of John, John Gere's decree. It is said he presented um, hundreds of references and verses from Vedic Shastra supporting the use of Kanti Mala and Tilak. And this impressed the emperor, John Gere. But Gokulanath's main argument, for his main argument, he said as follows. And I'm quoting him. Emperor, during your father's rule, which means Akbar, we all lived peacefully in Braj, without any restrictions on our religious practices. Your father even encouraged us in our practices by donating land for our purposes and helped to build temples. We know that history. Surely he wouldn't be pleased with the harsh decree that has descended upon us. We beg you, Sir, remove it. So it is said that, impressed with the arguments of 80-year-old Gokul Natas, 
but even more by Gokulnath's purity and saintliness. Emperor Jahangir immediately abolished the decree and sent an order that all his soldiers should immediately leave, leave Vrindavan and return to their base in Agra. Hare Krishna. We bow down to that Gokulnath. So many heroes. We have heroes we know about, and there's so many Vaishnav and Vaishnavi heroes in the history of Krishna consciousness through the millenniums. We, we, we'll never hear of them, or, or like this, we're fortunate to hear about them. At their point in history, they defended Krishna consciousness. And we should also, as followers of Sri Prabhupada, defend Prabhupada's movement against the atheists, <laughs> against the atheistic scientists, against the politicians who tried to stop us, against our own attraction <laughs> to what's left of this material energy. We should defend like this great devotee did. So historically, I learned that um, Emperor uh, Jahangir, he actually died one week later while traveling back to his main headquarters, main headquarters in present day Lahore, Pakistan. Just in time, he made this, he abolished that decree. What's also interesting is that the actual document canceling the decree is preserved in the Balabha Sampradaya somewhere in one of their temples or headquarters, they actually have the document. Very old, this is going back to the 1600s, they keep it. Now when uh, Gokulnath Das, you can imagine, arrived back in Vrindavan, all the people of Braj, all the Sampradayas were there to welcome him with an elaborate RT, foot bathing ceremony, and Pushpanjali flowers so many flowers. And later, um, the heads of all the Sampradayas met and conferred upon him the title Bade Maharaj. Bade, B-A-D-E, Bade Maharaj, the great Maharaj of Braj. And he certainly deserved it. People in Vrindavan still remember him. This is 400 years ago. There's a famous saying, Gokulnath Bade Maharaj, Tilak Mala Kiraki Laja, meaning hail to Gokulnath, who was a great king and who saved our Tilak and Mala. Now you can have even, have even more pride in the sense that we're marking the body as, as um, the residence of the Lord in the heart. It's, it's a temple and we're using it properly in Krishna's service so we can proudly wear our Tilak in 12 places. <laughs> <laughs> and our Kanti Mala, we can show it. Hare Krishna. Isn't that wonderful pastime? <laughs> there must be so many we don't know about. Oh, Krishna. But we have the pastimes of our beloved Sri Prabhupada, how he traveled the world at least 12 times, spread Krishna consciousness, and introduced Kanti Mala and Tilak to literally tens of thousands. So let us say now, millions of people, all glorious to Sri Prabhupada. He's decorating the world with this Tilak and Katimal and the holy names of Krishna. So we will conclude today with a description of the importance of wearing Katimala or neck beads uh, from our GBC handbook or DT worship book they put out. Uh, um, those who compile this very important work, how we should conduct deity worship, they um, have written, like Urdhva Pundra, beads worn around the neck indicate a devotee's surrender to the Lord. And therefore, a person wearing Tulsi beads around his neck is dear to the Lord. However, a person is an offender if he wears Tulsi neck beads simply to imitate a Vaishnava, but is not seriously trying to surrender to the Lord. Some devotees also wear other kinds of auspicious malas, either made of tulsi beads, lotus seeds, uh, rope from Jagannath, Rathayata, or silk pavitras, like this one, while performing puja, japa, or other um, sacred functions. 
uh, they go on to say, these should be removed when bathing or leaving the temple or house. The Kanti Mala is worn permanently, for these beads protect one from uh, bad dreams, accidents, attacked by weapons, and the servants of Yamaraj. Upon seeing Tulsi Mala, the Yamadutas flee like leaves scattered by the wind. Hare Krishna. Kanti Mala made of Tulsi beads key. Our Japa Mala key. Our Vaishnava tradition key. Shri Vrindavan key. Shri Rabhavapad key. Thank you, Prabhu. I love the research. I love sharing it with you. There's just, we've got a gold mine over there at the Institute. And although I'm going to be traveling now, I have my helpers, little elves, who are over there researching. So um, again, not two times a week, um, every Friday. I hope you look forward to it. I do. Uh, even in the midst of my travels and the Polsky tour, wow, um, we've got about 50 festivals lined up along the Baltic Sea coast. We get about three or 4,000 people a night. I'm leaving Brudge. It's very hard, very hard to leave Brudge, but like Prabhupada, we leave with the purpose to share Brudge, to share Brudge with the world. So I'm doing it very happily. Back on Sankirtan, back on the beaches, chanting Hare Krishna, distributing books, and my festival lecture. I'm going to give it over 50 times. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. See you next Friday. O glories to Sridhar Prabhupada. Shishi Gorani Tai Ki, Shishi Krishna Balaram Ki, Shishi Radha Shama Sundar Ki, Brindavaneshwari Shimati Radharani Ki, Mayapur Dham Ki, Shishi Gorani Tai Ki, Shri Krishna Sen Kirtan Yagya Ki, The Polski Tour Ki, Nitai Gol Premanandi, Jay Jay Sisi Radhe. Thank you.